Good day. My name is Andre Ward, and I'm the Associate Vice President of the David Rothenberg Center for Public Policy at the Fortune Society. Welcome to Both Sides of the Bars, a discussion-driven show that examines the criminal legal system from various perspectives, including people most impacted by the criminal legal system. We discuss critical questions about how the current system works, its intersections with social justice, and how we highlight the efforts that are being made to improve the lives of everyone affected. We ask you, the viewer, to please spread the word about both sides of the bars and share your comments with us on Twitter at the Fortune SOC. Today's show is really, really important and has real implications, not only locally here in New York City, but also throughout the entire country. The importance of higher education programs and prison college opportunity is one of the most impactful activities that we can be offered in prison. Restoring access to college financial aid to help low-income people in prison prepare to re-enter society is a moral imperative and a public good. With 46,000 people locked up in 54 prisons in New York State and a budget of over $3.2 billion in fiscal year 2018 alone, New York State's prison system is clearly bloated. New York's overall recidivism rate is 40%. However, College in-prison programs like the Bard Prison Initiative and Hudson Link see less than 3% of their participants recidivate. It costs over $69,000 per year in New York State to incarcerate one person, while it costs only $9,000 per year to for a person to attend the Bard Prison Initiative. Compare a $69,000 investment annually with a 40% failure rate to a $9,000 investment annually with a 97% success rate, and it becomes painfully, painfully clear that New York State Tuition Assistance Program, or TAP funding, is an effective solution to reforming the criminal justice system in New York State. Today, we will speak with educators and advocates about the importance of college programs in prison and the need to fund those programs. The guest that we had today, and we're really excited, it's Stephanie Bazell. She serves as the Director of Policy and Advocacy at College and Community Fellowship. Jody Anderson, Jr., who is the President and Co-Founder of Pipe Dreamers Foundation. Daiwan Tantro, who is, serves as the Senior Government Affairs Officer at the Bard College Initiative. And Rob Scott, who is the Executive Director of the Cornell Prison Education Program. Ladies, gentlemen, people, welcome to both sides of the bars. How are you feeling today? Feeling great, Andre. Thank you for having us. Well, thank you for joining us, obviously, for this episode of Both Sides of the Bars to really discuss this important issue. And Stephanie and Daiwan in particular, you know, I've spoken with you guys. You've interviewed several times in different areas and venues and certainly have been some of the major proponents of this key legislation, beneficiaries off of this, as well as supporters of others joining on. And then Robert, in your academic role in the work that you do, and for just for our, our listening audience and our viewers, um, Dr. Scott is an executive director of the Cornell Prison Education Program and an adjunct professor of development and education at Cornell. So he obviously has a vested interest in this. And then we're also joined by our other guest who is at Stanford University who sees the need for college prison programs as something that's very, very important. I want to get right to you, Stephanie, starting this thing off because you know, you and the work that you do at College and Community Fellowship, which essentially works with women who have been impacted by the criminal legal system and are seeking to live a life of contribution through access to higher education, employment, all those other kind of things, um, have been really pushing this. And, you know, what should a higher education in prison mission statement be, right? Is it merely the same as any other educational institution? Yeah, that's something that I think we need to think critically about as we have a new dawning of an era of college and prison programming. Because with Pell being reinstated, um, hopefully TAP is reinstated as well. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's you know, it's not guaranteed by any means, even though the governor put it forth in her proposal. Uh, new York has been very regressive on this issue. But um, as as someone who works in the field of uh, reentry and uh, formerly incarcerated individuals, it is imperative, I think, that institutions be thinking not only just about uh, 
the the students obviously the students are scholars and that above all else um but there should also be uh thinking of ways in which they can be relied upon um as people begin to navigate the world post release um and that's not to say that um higher education and prison programs need to become reentry providers um but they you know everything that people think about when they think about success in education mm -hmm. it's it's not merely just books and things like that it's also just housing security, food security, things like that are all necessary in the obtaining of an education. So I think the mission statement is broader and you are fulfilling a, um, a higher goal if you are a higher education in prison program provider than um, what a college institution is doing. Although ultimately at the end of the day, you're both contributing to an individual's uh, self-efficacy and self-determination. Got it. And shifting to you, Daiwan, you know, this issue is both personal and it's professional, right? And taken together has really like strengthened your resolve, right? To make sure that the need for higher education in prison is amplified. Talk to us about like where that passion comes from in that way and, and why is this so valuable? Well, I think Andre, you know, I'm someone who spent 12 years in prison and got an education Ooh. through the Barclays Initiative and that education radically changed the trajectory of my life. Here I sit today, less than five years after being released, and I'm a senior advisor at the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee doing national campaign work. You know, I'm the first formerly incarcerated person to ever work there at that level in the history of the organization. And so I look at that and compare to where my two brothers' lives. I had an older brother who's been, a young, been to prison. I got a younger brother who's been to prison. And what's been mm -hmm. able for me to accomplish in the world has been radically different compared to theirs because they didn't have access to education while they were incarcerated. And just if we look at the history of this issue, Andre, you know, policymakers knew in 1994, and they know it today, that if someone gets an education in prison, they are not only the least likeliest to ever go back, what we call recidivism, but have some of the most successful um, life outcomes of any other demographic of, of formerly incarcerated individuals. So this is really, really life changing. But just to dig into that history for a moment and just want people to think about the scope and the detriment of these bans. When the Pell ban went in place at the federal level in 1994, college and prison programs nationally dropped from over 700 to less than 10. In 1995, when New York State subsequently followed with the TAP ban, the number of programs in New York State dropped from over 70 to four, right? And so we were talking about really limited access that has been pernicious, that has detrimentally impacted people's ability to leave prison with the tools they need to rebuild their lives post release. And finally, here we are today in New York, after over 20 years with a governor who has spoke about, you know, how higher education changed her life, committing to restoring access to the tuition assistance program in New York to incarcerated individuals. It is urgent. It is needed. And we know it is important, right? And for all types of reasons. We're going to reduce recidivism, we'll make prisons safer, but we'll also put people back in their communities in ways where they can join society as productive citizens and lead successful lives. And ultimately, that should be the goal, right? The, the Pell ban and the TAP ban in 94, 95 gave a lie to what policy makers also talk about usually talk about as the purpose of prison, which is rehabilitation, right? Mm -hmm. Those bans said that we have an interest in people's punishments and not their futures. And we're gonna reverse that this year in New York. And so it's abundantly clear, right? Um, why you're passionate about that. And I wanna obviously transition now to uh, Dr. Scott. Um, following Dr. Scott, what Stephanie and Daiwan has kind of rolled out, you know, what does the future hold for like, further developing higher education in prison in New York State and across the country, because this is not just a state, New York State issue, right? Obviously, having education prisons nationally really speaks to the notion of empowering people to come out to live productive lives. So talk to, about, talk to us about that, Dr. Scott. 
Sure, thank you all. And uh, yeah, my colleagues, Stephanie and Daiwan, don't leave me much to add in terms of um, just having a great um, introductory explication of the significance of higher education in prison. Um, looking forward, and you know, I might, I might build a little bit on um, Stephanie's theme there, um, the wider mission that I see for higher education in prison programs really as part of the intellectual fabric mm -hmm. of this country. Um, is envisioning a future we get to where when there is harm in society, we have first thoughts about things other than incarceration that are going to be necessary to remedy the situation. Um, so people put a lot of different words on that, decarceration, abolition, other things like that. Um, but for me, the main thing that's going on right now is we have this very small toolbox that we go to when there's harm in society. It's called call the police. It's called put people in jail. It's called segregating people from their families, from their communities. And college and prison has been so much about bringing back that basic humanity that provides for the social fabric that allows people to participate in society in a way in which you can see a future beyond the bars. Um, so much of what Taiwan was saying echoes all of that. Um, mm -hmm. So when I look further into the future, I think, one, there, there are some low-hanging fruits that mainly respond to the current moment. Um, which is decade after decade of the emphasis on punishment and not whether you want to call it rehabilitation, programming, social life, uh, meaningful and intellectual engagement with the world, critical engagement with the conditions that have produced the harms and that the harms are multidirectional. It's not just that some person wakes up one morning and says, I'm going to go hurt my community. It's, it's that there's always, if we really look at it in the year 2022, we can think this way. Mm -hmm. Folks that go out and harm society have also been harmed. And they're harmed in prison. So I think uh, when we look to that future, we say, okay, some some low hanging fruits here are things like this: restore basic financial aid for people in prison who want to go to college. This is so basic. And I should sure. say there are other states, maybe the blue states to start with, that could restore their um, sort of parallel structures to what is called TAP or the Tuition Assistance Program in New York, Colorado, California, Illinois, New Jersey, all took away state financial aid programs after the Pell Grant, was, uh, Pell Grant ban was signed into law by President Clinton in 1994. Um, another thing I think we see is just the fact that we can't afford it. As a society, we can't afford mass incarceration, what we call mass incarceration. The pandemic actually brought that out. It, I, some of us have, have studied this. Um, as soon as they stopped the jail to prison transfers from the county jails to the state prisons in many states in this country, you saw decarceration rapidly happening. And guess what happens when you, it turns out it's very expensive for the counties to participate in all of the COVID controls. They decide it's more valuable to keep a person in the community and in programming and in other things as our alternatives to incarceration, rather mm -hmm. than put it on the public nickel to harm that person and to pay folks to do the jailing. So mm -hmm. I think we see decarceration, we see an increase in alternatives, and we see a pathway in which education continues to expand because educational institutions are the ones that actually expand the domain of what we think about, talk about, and produce. It's the place that we generate knowledge and generate alternatives. So to me, um, you know, the tap mm -hmm. restoration for people in prison is right at the axis of criminal justice reform and education reform that leads to that society that really doesn't look like what we've been doing when there's harm in society over the past several decades in this country. Absolutely. And as someone who was incarcerated, right, I know my experience, right, in 1993, 94, I had taken a couple of classes in college at the time. And for those who are interested in education, it becomes an enlightening experience. And therefore, people begin to take accountability for their actions, develop a deeper moral understanding, right, about their actions vis-a-vis -vis the impact on their communities. And now as someone who's been home and is now a doctoral student, I understand the importance of education. I want to transition now to Jody, right, and hear your comments and thoughts relative to what others have just talked about, about the importance of having college and programs. Jody? Yeah, thank, thank, thank you for that, for sure. Um, I guess my own personal experience with being incarcerated uh, mm -hmm. is a very uh, unique one. So I attended Cornell Prison uh, Education Program under Dr. Scott, truly transformative. I think up until that point, largely removed from society. Uh, and so it was, it was bringing that community from the outside um, and inside an incarcerated setting, uh, giving us an opportunity to re-engage with the world at large, right? Uh, and, and then like, entertaining the notion that we would be contributing members to society at some point, 
but that program mm -hmm. made it very real for us. I think up until that point, um, I got my GED and maybe taking a few college courses uh, in a juvenile facility, but but nothing that connected me to like a larger mission, a larger community on the outside. Um, and I, I think that's definitely what college does. Um, I, I also don't think it's, it's isolated to like that network. I think the, the education that goes on um, in, in, inside of incarcerated settings is indeed like comparable to what to what happens on the outside. So you, you'll see the transition from being locked up, uh, attending CPEP, and then uh, taking that entire experience um, on, on the outside and having the same network help me transition back into society and then create a, a new life for myself and for my family as well. Um, so even making a transition to Stanford, transferring, um, CPEP helped with that entire process, helped me get my documents, um, for helping me find employment, helping me get letters of recommendation, helping me like, uh, apply to get transferred out of state. I mean, and it's those kind of like wraparound services that mm -hmm. I, I, like, I, it, it just pays dividends in the future. And, and it starts with those like small investments, like receiving those grants, make sure education is accessible to everybody, because that puts you on a different pathway, right? Whereas I, I think the counterfactual is me not receiving that education early on and then trying to figure out things for myself and kind of utilizing like, more of the state resources like once i am released right um in a way that it isn't nearly as productive as as, as what happened when i when i received an education and then uh use that experience and, and use that network to really change my life trajectory so i, I definitely agree with what everyone is saying here um and, and I, I think quite frankly it's a small investment compared to uh, what, what it costs to incarcerate a single human being right education, so small price absolutely and so speaking of investments right transitioning to to Stephanie, right? You know, as, as we think about this a bit more deeply, um, how is education like related to abolition in some way? And I'm gonna take these questions. I know like, we don't have enough time. We should have two hours for this conversation, but I wanna make sure I start just address these things. But Stephanie, how how is education related to abolition? Well, it's, I mean, uh, I think Rob really uh, spoke illustrated this well. Um, and it's interesting because, you know, there's a lot of different framing around this conversation. And what's fascinating is that either way, it's when you talk about it being uh, related to abolition, there's immediately this response that, oh, wow, OK, that's very progressive, you know, all of that. At the same time, what we're really talking about is the same thing that a lot of people have coined as smart on crime, which is doing things that are actually going to reduce the incidence of crimes because crime is a deficit, as was discussed, in societal structures. One has to be failed by society 99% of the time systemically before they are then entering the system. So um, for us, education is related and our posture at College and Community Fellowship and the orientation of Reverend Vivian Nixon and now our new executive director, Romero and Ralston, is that education is related to um, empowerment. And that has always been the case. Mm -hmm. And it has always been taken away as a means to control and as a means um, to oppress. Um, and providing education allows people uh, to be given the critical thinking skills to be able to then dismantle the very systems and create the changes in society that will allow them and their communities to thrive. And a lot of studies have shown that people, uh, like predictors for incarceration and looking at the carceral population, people come from the same very small segregated communities uh, that have an overabundance in, of cyclical incarceration. Um, but we say that at the same time, and, and that is not to say that um, you know, someone who is on the more conservative side should be afraid of that by any means, because mm -hmm. it's also been stated when working with law enforcement leaders to reduce crime and incarceration, the law enforcement was saying, if you want to be truly tough on crime, this is what you're doing. Um, so it sits, it's important to note that it sits in that, that interesting intersection in terms of education being liberation is incredibly important and powerful and that's what it is um but at the same time it should be politically palatable to all and that's the frustration and why it hasn't passed in new york um mm -hmm. given that there's just it, it it should be able to satiate every 
um, community. But absolutely, um, it is related to abolition because of what Rob said, because we can then picture a society in which we are preventing the crime prior to when it happens. And Daiwan, you have invariably like lifted these some of those similar thoughts up in your writings, right, and just in, in your engagement in different spaces. What are some of your re reactions to what Stephanie has said? Then we'll transition to Doc, to uh, Dr. Scott and and to Jody as we close up. Yeah, you know, I I think that college and prison is fundamentally connected, um, you know, to decarceration in the sense that, you know, people who are educated in prison um, don't recidivate, right? The recidivism number for our BA students at BPI is less than 4%, you know, and that's been over the past 20 years. And that's in stark contrast to the average recidivism rate in New York of over 40%, right? So we're talking about a 10 time um, reduction in recidivism. So when people don't go back to prison, right? That decarcerates the system, Andre. But I think more importantly than those individuals not returning back to prison, you know, in and of themselves, is that those individuals, BPI alumni overwhelmingly, return to their community in work and capacities on the ground to change the conditions and circumstances that led to their incarcerations in the first place, right? right? If you look all over New York, you will find BPI alumni doing that important work. You know, some BPI alumni led um, the um, movement to close Rikers, right? Andre, you know Darren Mack, BPI alumni, um, Wesley Keynes is the chief sure. staff at the Bronx Defenders doing really, really important decarceral work, right? We have alumni at CCI, we have alumni at CCA, we have alumni at the Fortune Society, at Osborne, um, working on the foundational side of um, criminal justice at the Ford Foundation, at Galaxy Gives, at the Open Society Foundation, right? In grant making, decision making roles, right? Allocating money into the space that further decarcerates New York and doing that work also in other states, right? When we give people in prison, right, the tools they need to build um, productive lives back in their communities, that has a radical impacts beyond just them and their families, right? And so I, I think, you know, sometimes people, we get people who are against college and prison sort of on both sides of the divide, right? You have conservatives who will say, well, those people don't deserve an education, right? And, you know, as one of my colleagues eloquently said to that, is that it's not a question of deserve, right? It's a question of what am I going to do with it? And today that individual um, is a PhD student at Cornell, mm -hmm. right? And on the other side of that, you have people in the abolition space who are saying, well, why are you making an investment in prisons? Well, really, really important to note that this investment is not in prisons, right? This investment is in people, right? The money that we're talking about is going to these individuals, just like any other American or New Yorker, as a grant that they use with colleges like Bard, like Cornell, like NYU, for the purpose of pursuing a degree while they're incarcerated. Right. Mm -hmm. And those individuals are not going to land back in the system. And so I think like Stephanie highlighted, this is really, really important work that speaks to sort of everyone's concerns on both sides of, you know, what we also what we usually call the aisle. Right. And so we have a few minutes, about two or three minutes left. And I want to get to Dr. Scott um, and your work at Cornell and, and what distinguishes the in-prison program. Right. Um, if you can share that in a in, in, in a couple of, about a minute or two, and then we'll turn to Jody for just some closing thoughts. Okay, well, let's see if, I'll be real quick to try to add one thing um, that maybe hasn't been said yet, because as sure. we've all seen, everyone said a lot of the great stuff. Um, one of the sides of um, the work at Cornell that's distinct um, is that we send over a hundred people, um, most of whom have never been in a prison before, into prison every year to do this work. Mm -hmm. um, including many young people, including many pre-law folks. We've had over 100 people that have gone to prison while as an undergraduate at Cornell, um, get into the law professions. And they're also working at the Bronx Defenders and all these organizations that Taiwan just mentioned. Um, we've had several of our grad students then create college and prison programs in other states. Um, and we've seen many people make policy careers. 
um, become teachers who, you know, teaching isn't always the profession that people are steered to when they go to an Ivy League institution. Um, and so I think it's just important to recognize there's always this bi-directionality in everything. That's right. um, we enter a very warped language space when we go into criminal justice work. There's not even a consensus on what we mean when we say justice or corrections. Um, but certainly when we start talking about our students, um, the big radical thing here has been said and is um, embodied by this talk is amplifying their voices and finding a language that actually comes to grips with the reality of 2022 is something that we can't do without dialogue and classrooms in prisons actually actually create the literal physical space to have those dialogues. Mm -hmm. I'll stop there so we can get our good colleague Jody back in. Thank you. And colleague and Jody had some closing thoughts. And then, folk, just in like a 10 second, how could people get in contact with you? Jody? No, no problem. I, I would definitely say um, that, that, that's super important to realize that hundreds of thousands of people return from incarcerated things every year. So you are always encountering people who have been incarcerated, who have been just as impacted. I'll, I'll give you just a, a brief example. Uh, one of the teaching assistants at, Cor at the Cornell Prison Education Program, I ended up graduating. I remember at my graduation, she was, she was there on the other side, right, as, as like a free citizen. Um, and then she ended up going to Stanford Law School. Uh, and I transferred to Stanford and then coincidentally ran into her on campus, just showing how like we are actual citizens. Everyone is in this world together. And then she launched uh, the prison education program uh, here at Stanford, and it's been like leading the charge and contacting DAs in different districts. So all that stemming from like, a tiny program, right, uh, that, that started in Ithaca, Ithaca uh, that really, really blossomed into something that changed people's uh, lives for the better, like the policy level, state level, and then on individual level, just true community um, uh, for the betterment of everyone. Sure. Thank you so much for that, Jody. Stephanie, how can people get in contact with you in five seconds, if that's um, possible? Yes. Well, actually, if you go to turnonthetap.org um, and enter um, that you're interested in receiving information, we, we get that and um, we'll connect you and put you on a listserv where you'll get um, a lot of information about this. Um, and hopefully and anyone can reach out to me by email or phone any time. Thank you. Daiwan? Yeah, to make it easy um, for folks, so just Daiwan Tatro, first name, last name um, on Twitter, D-Y-J-U-A-N-T-A-T-R-O. Perfect. Uh, Dr. Scott? People are always welcome to go to the Cornell Prison Education Program's website. Go to Google and put in Cornell Prison Education Program. I'm sure you'll find our whole staff and whoever you want to talk to. Thanks. Jody? Uh, I think you just simply type it, Jody Anderson Jr., probably on all platforms. I, I think it's a pretty public story at this point. Uh, looking forward to everyone. Coming. Well, everyone, thank you so much for joining us, and we'll certainly have you back on. And so, you know, I'd like to also thank the viewers for joining us for this thought-provoking discussion. You know, in the meantime, on behalf of the Fortune Society, we thank you so much for tuning in to both sides of the bars. If you're interested in finding out more about the Fortune Society, please check us out on the web at fortunesociety.org. That's fortunesociety.org. Um, you can also go to Facebook and type it in the Fortune Society. My name is Andre Ward, and as always, we thank you for joining us on both sides of the bars. Thank you.